Hi, Christine. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Hi. Oh, my God. It's so great to see all of you together. <laughs> it makes, makes, <laughs> makes me smile. Wow. Good to see you. Christine, we're waiting for, I don't know if you can hear me from back there, but we're waiting for Jeremy to come and then we'll be a full crew here. Excellent. Excellent. I have to say, I, I think that this feels so shocking to me because this is the first time that I've logged on to do something like this where I'm not seeing all the little boxes. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. Yeah, it is nice to see people gathering. Uh, while we wait, um, I just wanted to do a few housekeeping tips. And um, everybody should have received an email this week um, with instructions to log in to Studio B's online portal. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, I am going to drop my email in the chat. So I'm happy to help if anybody has any questions. Uh, what we have uh, offered the Cole Creative team is a 30 day access to Studio B's online portal. And what you're going to find in there is um, access to guided meditations as well as movement practices and teacher talks. Uh, today's session is going to be recorded, so if there's anything that you want to go back to by early next week, you'll have a, a recorded version of today. So um, Christine is going to kick things off, and Christine is uh, the Vice President of Development and Lead Trainer of Conscious Communications and Emotional Intelligence for Studio B. And today she is going to present, and then we're going to follow up in uh, a week or two uh, with another session on anchoring. So enjoy today, and please let me know if you need anything. Thank you. Is Jeremy there? Jeremy's here. All right, so we can go ahead and get started. Great. So I, I know many of you, and some of you I've not met before, but I'm very, very fond of the Cole Creative team. And I'm so excited that um, you've made a decision to embark upon some training in mindfulness, especially now. I mean, there's no better time to do this. So I really want to take you into a practice. I want to dive right into it. And then what I'd like to do is to sort of teach through the practice so that when we come out of it, I'm going to be really interested in your experience of it. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the things that happen to you neurologically, biochemically, hormonally, while we, while we were actually experiencing this very short practice. So this practice is known as centering, and it comes out of the work of the Strozzi Institute. And the Strozzi Institute is responsible for a concept that is known as embodied leadership. So what I like about the notion of embodied leadership is that Strozzi teaches us that leadership is not just something we do. Leadership becomes part of who we are. If you've ever been in a situation where you've been in the presence of a person who embodied who they are, it's compelling. Before they even open their mouth, they just embody their purpose, their commitment. And so you don't have to even have to use the word leadership. You know, you can think about, can you show up in life fully embodied in what matters to you? Centering helps us to get there because again, I can lead all day long based on what I'm saying, what I'm typing, what I'm texting, right? Um, how I'm relating to others. But the missing element in that kind of leadership is the degree to which I'm actually living out my principles, my purpose. There's a big difference and it's my belief that over the course of the last six months, if you've been doing any leading, any managing, if you've been working really hard, you know firsthand you've been doing it differently because you're being called to. We are seeing what I call the new face of leadership, the new face of workplace relations. And so let's let part of that new face be about 
how you show up, how you show up to what you do, how you show up to how you live. So the practice that I'm going to take you through helps to get you there because it's felt. Okay. So I see all of you. You can't turn your cameras off. Um, what I'd like you to do is I want to invite you to bring your feet hip width apart so that they're resting on the floor beneath you. And I want you to just sit up a little bit straighter so that you feel a length in your spine. Good. And as you're sitting up a little bit straighter, and this is important, we want that length in the spine, but I also want you to be relaxed in your body. So we don't want to be robotic or statuesque about it, all right? I also want to, and this is always an invitation, you'll always find this with Studio B, there's always an invitation to close your eyes. So you can close your eyes, and if you choose not to close your eyes, it's perfectly fine. We bring our gaze forward, and we bring it down slightly so that at least the eye muscles are nice and relaxed. And we're going to begin this process called centering with three really intentional breaths. You've taken all day, all week, the last six months, take it in big. And as you exhale, allow that exhalation to be a little bit longer than that inhalation. And again, take a very deep breath in. And as you exhale, allow the exhale to be a little bit longer as if it's bringing you down, settling your system. Good. And one more time, deep breath in. Exhale, lengthening the exhale a little bit longer. Good. And now just allow the breath to return to normal or natural. However it's showing up for you right now is perfectly fine. And just noticing. Maybe noticing their weight. Maybe noticing how they feel against the floor. Maybe noticing anything you're wearing on the feet, the sensation. Maybe noticing the stability of your own feet. Connecting with this knowing of all the places these feet have taken you. That no matter what is happening, you can always stand on your own two feet. You've got that kind of strength. And now gently guiding your awareness to your spine. Noticing the length of your spine.
observing any sensation that's there. The spine has been holding you up all day, every day. And there is a dignity that lives in you. And we can feel our own dignity in the length and the tallness of our own spine. When we stand up tall, knowing that whatever's happening, I can always lean back into my own back. I have my own back. And now take your awareness to your shoulders. Allow the shoulders to drop down and maybe bring them back just a little bit, very subtle. And as you do that, you might notice an expansion through the chest, a softening, a softening through this place that can get really tight when we're anxious. knowing that no matter what's happening, you can meet any situation with this kind of openness. And so we are nice and centered through the spine grounded through the feet. Open through the chest and the shoulders. And just notice how those adjustments feel. Notice anything that these three adjustments might be teaching you. Gently guide your awareness back to your breath. And whenever you're ready, but only when you're ready, open your eyes and let the light and the room come to you. Don't go searching out, allow the space around you, take it in, allow it to come to you. That's the centering practice. Three things. Getting a little taller in the spine. Feet hip width apart, making contact with the floor. Shoulders down and back. Those were the three adjustments that we made. 
over the course of about seven minutes. We were in that for about seven minutes. So I'm kind of curious before I sort of tell you a little bit about the science of what happens during that, that experience of how you're feeling or what that was like for you. And sky's the limit. I'm, I'm curious about any kind of reactions to that. It might have been wonderful, it might have been terrible, somewhere in between. Go for it. We are unmuted. Can you hear us? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was getting, that was an excellent experience. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I frequent afternoon naps and it had that vibe, but it was like a, say like a next level maybe to that. Okay, that's really good. And that's an important point. Here's why. My, my intention was not to put you to sleep. Sure. My, my intention was to create a situation where you could be in relaxed alertness, right? So one of the benefits of a, good, of a quick nap, like a power nap, yes. is that you, we wake up feeling both relaxed and alert, as opposed to, did you ever lay down to take a nap and you wake up two hours later and you feel totally disoriented and not very functional? Yes. Naps, by the way, I, I highly recommend the power nap for the reason that you described. Yeah, that's exactly it. I feel like when I do a nap the right way, I feel like it gets a bunch of sort of clutter out of my head. Like um, it's almost as if there's like like a sort of like a jagged, uh, hot sort of thing. I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's uh, it's like I let some steam off. Yeah, and I love your description because the jagged feeling, the heat that you're actually feeling, probably in the head area, right? Yes. That is a stressed brain. Yes. That is the brain under stress. It's real. Those physiological sensations are real. And so you drop yourself out of that or you shift yourself out of that with the nap or in, with something like what we just did pretty quickly. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I feel like I had a body almost. It was like, I wasn't in my body, I was like, I like to see myself, but it just felt like an out-of-body experience. Mm. Yeah, that can happen too. I'm wondering, I would have been curious about what your state was prior to coming into that. If I have a high level of stress and I do something like that, that sort of shifts me out of it in a really profound way, it can, here I am in my body in this highly stressed state, <laughs> it can feel like I left my body, right? Um, so that's, that just speaks to the degree of your willingness to allow yourself to relax. Okay, it's a good. Anyone else? As long as you're back with us. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I remember when I, when I first started meditating, I didn't even know what I was doing. I didn't know I was meditating at this time. This is 30 years ago. I had experiences like what you're describing, except even more extreme. And I would get to the point where I would think, wherever I'm at, I like it here so much better. I didn't want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I, I mean, for me, like, um, I'm like, I do meditate occasionally, um, and like what we just did, um, I, uh, I sort of studied this thing that was called 61 point relaxation, where it was very like fine points throughout the body, and you just go through and relax each one, and you mm -hmm. focus on each one of that each one of those and um, this reminded me of that and especially with um, like the spine area once you get to that spine and that list of points it's just um, like it's such a physical feeling once you start relaxing your back area and everything like that and the combination of like having the feet grounded and straightening out the spine and uh, 
dropping the shoulders. It was a, a lot quicker than going through 61 points. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, wow, yeah. The sensation of the combination of that and like, I'm never typically like seated like this where I have my feet on the floor. Um, and it was, it was a neat experience and very relaxing. I've never heard of the 61 point meditation. Now I'm curious, I'll be looking this up, right? So that's a, that's a very elaborate body scan, 61 points, which develops inevitably an awareness of your body, like unlike anything you've ever had before, right? So that's, that's awesome that you've been doing that. And what we just did, you, you said something that's really important. It is a fast track. It is a quick way out of stress response and into a different state. Now, not all the time. It some of you might be sitting here thinking, that was terrible. My mind was all over the place. I couldn't wait for it to be over. You know, we can, and you can have the same experience later on this afternoon if I guided you through this, which might be totally different, right? No meditation is the same for me. But here's what I want you to know about what we just did, the centering practice. It takes 45 seconds to two minutes of that to start to create this biochemical hormonal shift, all right? So you'll notice there were three things we highlighted. The lengthening of the spine, the feet, hip width apart, nothing is crossed. When we cross, and there's nothing wrong with crossing if you're doing it now, it's fine, right? But just know that when we cross, when we're meditating, we're locking up energy. So we wanna to try to uncross. And crossing sometimes can um, have us in a slight stress state, right? Because it can be a defensive posture, right? And it can just be how we're comfortable. But feet rooted into the floor and then the shoulders down and back. When we straighten up for the, from, through the spine, right? Whenever we get a little bit taller in the spine, what I want you to know is that is one of the ways we cue the brain. It's like saying to your brain, hey, I'm not in danger right now. We've been in this global pandemic for six months and I'm okay. So I don't need my amygdala, which is the alarm system of your brain. I don't need you on 911 alert 24 seven. This is where most of us have been. This is where most of the planet has been now for six months. 911 sirens blaring, scared. We're not meant to be in that state all the time, okay? Centering through the spine is like a message to your amygdala saying, everything's cool. If I need you, I invite you to sound the alarms, but everything's okay. It's like turning down the volume of all the cortisol that's been coursing through your bloodstream, that stress hormone, of all the adrenaline, it's turning it down, even turning it off. It gives the system a break. When I bring my feet hip width apart and I really touch into my own strength, don't be scared of what I'm about to say. We turn up just a little bit in men and women, a little bit of testosterone. It is that connection and that presence of that hormone that gives us the sense of, no matter what I have to face, I've got it. Like I can always stand on my own two feet. You know that phrase, stand on your own two feet, right? We can, I can do that. And then finally, this is my favorite part, shoulders down and back. I start generating the beloved oxytocin. Oxytocin is known affectionately as the cuddle hormone. Oxytocin 
is running high in two bodies that are intertwined in an embrace. Oxytocin runs high in the body of a woman who's just given birth, in the body of her partner who's holding the baby for the first time. Oxytocin is running strong when you hold or pet your pet. Oxytocin is running strong when two people are connecting in a loving way while making love. Oxytocin is running strong when you and I are having a conversation and we're really present and we're really engaged and we're really touching into each other. Oxytocin is running strong whenever I am giving an act of compassion. Oxytocin runs strong when I'm compassionate toward myself. So I don't need to be holding someone for oxytocin to be present. When oxytocin is present, it often turns up serotonin. And when serotonin is present in the brain, there is this calming impact. So what's important about dropping the shoulders down and back is I invite my own body to begin generating oxytocin. In your own work, when you're connecting with clients, the connection is profoundly important to the work you're doing or the work you're going to do, right? For a prospective client, if I feel like I can connect to you, there's a really good chance that I'm going to give you my work. So can you enter into a client meeting? Can you enter into a difficult conversation? Can you have a team meeting where you know that there's some friction in the air. Can you enter in from a place where you are calm because your spine is nice and tall? You feel strong because your feet are grounded into the floor and you feel open. That's a game changer. Because most of us, if we even predict that there's going to be friction, we're gonna come in already defended, already defensive. And you see this in people's bodies. Just a little aside, for those of you here, myself included, that have been doing a lot of this Zoom work, I want you to start noticing the orientation of your own body, which is forward, because we wanna connect. Notice how infrequently you're sort of bringing yourself back, shoulders down and back, so that by the end of your Zoom day, you might, I had a Zoom day the other day, I thought, I'm gonna throw up after six hours of Zoom. I felt physically ill because I wasn't taking care of myself. There was a lot of this. When I come forward in my body this way, when I, they say, you collapse in through your own vertical line, that's why this chest can get really tight when we're anxious. In some way, we're in that defensive stance. And so we can pretty much know that that stress hormone's on. It's going. So back to my original introduction of the term, like what are you embodying, right? An embodied leader who walks into a room calm, strong, and connected. An embodied person, who, an embodied centered person who, who goes home today after your work day and, and walks into your house and the people in your house and you come in and you are calm, you're grounded, and you're open. That is a contagious energy. Stress is contagious, and so is calm. So I wanted to share that practice with you. It's been transformational for me in my own life. You can do it anywhere, anytime. You can have a meeting in an hour from now and decide, I'm gonna take my meeting with a different posture. So you don't have to do it as a formal seven minute meditation practice. You can, you can be getting ready to deliver a presentation. And before you go in and deliver the presentation, 
center yourself. It can take 15 seconds to do that. You can conduct the presentation from that stance, feet on the floor, grounded, awareness of that, that dignified posture, that openness. So one of the things I wanna share with you related to this is given everything that's happened over the course of the last six months or so, I mean, we, we've, we've all struggled in our own ways with the stress of it all. Being present is really hard right now. Being really, really present to our work, present to our people, present to ourselves. And so as often as possible, if you can make this adjustment, center, ground, open, you'll naturally call yourself into a state of presence and it will not only affect you, but it will affect those around you, right? Because that kind of energy, the energy of calm is really contagious. And it will also help to keep you well, right? The less cortisol I have running, the less adrenaline I have running, the more oxyto oxytocin is never going to drain me. Oxytocin is never going to affect my system in a negative way. Right? It's always going to nourish, nurture. You know, one of the things that so many of us are concerned about right now is how do I keep my own immunity strong? Right? And there's lots of different ways that we can do that. But part of keeping your immune system strong is trying as much as possible to keep yourself out of stress response. And so again, that very simple practice that I introduced is something that you can call upon very quickly. Um, one of the things that I've been doing every day is I try to center three times per day in about three minute, three minute blocks of time. So I've been using this practice for many, many years but using it more intentionally over the course of the last six months. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about centering? All right. So I'm going to take you just into really quickly, and we've got a small enough group that you stop me at any time. Can you all see these slides? Yes. Okay, good. All right, a couple of things, a couple of distinctions. At Studio B, we use the word meeting when it comes to difficult feelings, difficult situations, and stress. How do I meet stress mindfully as opposed to manage? We try not to use the word, for example, or the phrase stress management. The reason for that is that managing stress, managing people, managing a situation often sort of conjures an image of having to really control or manipulate or wrangle with something. There's a stress associated with managing versus meeting. Because I know that on any given day upon waking, I know that there are certain stressors that are gonna come into my day. So the question isn't, oh my God, how am I gonna manage all of that? The question is, all right, Christine, knowing what you know, how are you going to meet up with whatever comes into your day today? Meeting stress mindfully um, conjures up a much gentler type of approach. And it gives me a sense of this idea that I get to make a choice as to how I'm going to do that. So we went through the process of centering. I talked about what happened as we were centering. And I also want to share with you sort of my dirty little secret about stress. And it's a truth about stress. And it's my secret about stress over the course of the last six months. I am not in any way, shape, or form happy that we have had a global pandemic that has caused unprecedented amounts of stress. 
I am very happy and very grateful that I have taken aspects of my own stress level and I have lit a fire under my butt unlike ever before. So stress gets a really bad rap, generally speaking. But wow, there are some really positive aspects to stress. When you think about the things that you've done over the last six months, the changes that you've made, things that you've accomplished. I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago. Um, it was an interview with someone who's at Xfinity and someone who's at Ford Motor executives that work at a really high level there and they talked about like one of the benefits of the global pandemic is that they had to innovate really really quickly and some of the innovations and i'm not talking about oh these are changes we're making innovations like radically different products radically different ways of doing things radically different ways of leading uh, I think it was the woman from Comcast who said, we have done things in two weeks that might have otherwise taken us nine months for the good of the company. And so there can be a momentum and a fuel behind stress that prepares us to take really important action. And I also want to cue you into making a distinction between anxiety and excitement. This was a game changer for me, um, especially when I was uh, an undergraduate in college and having to do public speaking for the first time and hyperventilating during my first speech in Speech 101 as a college student. And my speech professor, I never had the courage to ask her, but after that happened, it was a couple of days later when I got my speech back, the grade, she invited me to be on the speech team, the competitive speaking team. And I'll, I never knew if it was because she felt sorry for me or if she felt that she saw something in me that she thought she could really help to grow. But what I learned, because I had extreme speech anxiety, was I learned how to take the sensation, anxiety is an energy, and to channel it in a way that created a sort of presentational momentum in me that was very passionate and very energized. And then I started thinking, you know, some of the things that I think I have anxiety about, it's not anxiety at all, it's excitement because the energy and the physical sensation of excitement is very similar to anxiety. So I just invite you to pay attention to that. Now, some of our stress is acute, it's situational, it's time bound. We know that this is not gonna last forever. Um, it's some sort of emergency, really difficult situation that occurs that we have to deal with very, very quickly, or a project with a tight deadline, we have to deal with it very quickly, and we do it. Stress becomes problematic when it is chronic, ongoing, and related to a threat that is ongoing. In my lifetime, I've never been in a situation where there was a threat out there in my external life that I can't see, that I really don't fully quite understand, and I have no idea what it's, when it's going to go away. So our current situation with a global pandemic, a very, very heated and charged political season and a lot of social unrest, uncertainty um, has created threat at very, very deep levels for so many of us. So what you might have noticed is that your stress level is not only higher, 
but that your stress is manifesting differently. And what I wanted to sort of put on your radar is that when we know this, wow, my sleep has been really awful. Or I've developed this new symptom that I've never had before. Or I think I'm actually having panic attacks. Or I cannot believe that I use the tone of voice that I just used in addressing my loved one. <laughs> Acute stress that's related to crisis that has no endpoint starts to express itself really differently. So I wanted to just put a couple of things on your radar. Awareness is everything. Each of you has your own stress signature. It's as unique to you as your thumbprint. I know that stress manifests for me first and foremost in my gastrointestinal system. In acute crisis-related stress, my gastrointestinal system, the symptoms are exaggerated. So know that in the physical body, you might notice that some of your signature stress symptoms are worsening. You might have noticed extreme levels of fatigue because this brain of ours is thinking about stuff that we're not even consciously aware of. It's working hard. And you may have noticed changes in your sleep. You're not sleeping as well. Your sleep is disrupted. You might be sleeping all weekend. Um, I'm just reporting some of the things people have been sharing with me that their sleep has become really wonky. So just pay attention. What's happening in my physical body? What's happening in my brain? We know that when the brain is stressed, especially when there's a lot of cortisol, a lot of adrenaline, just imagine your whole brain marinating in those hormones. We can't think straight. I triple booked myself last week. I've never done that. Stress, personal stress, global pandemic stress, work-related stress. You might notice that things have been slipping through the cracks. You might have noticed that your short-term memory isn't what it once was. You might be noticing that you can't find your car keys and they're in your hand. You can't find your sunglasses and they're on top of your head, things like that. You might be noticing brain fog, just this sense that I just wish I could go in and just clear away this dense fog because I'm missing mental clarity. These are some of the things that are happening cognitively to people. Emotionally, you might be noticing higher levels of anxiety if you struggle with anxiety. You might be noticing what I call bluer blues. I've certainly recognized this, that when I sort of go into more of a depressive mode, whew, it's at a different level. You might be noticing that this is all really erratic. You know, one day I can be so incredibly blue and the next morning wake up and think what was that because I feel completely different today or feeling that way you know when you wake up in the morning and by two o'clock it's as if something has you know a switch was flicked it's part of what's happening right now so that you can feel this being really erratic some of what's not on people's radar is the way that our stress is spilling over and into our close relationships. People are reporting an increased need to cling, right? I just need to be, I need to be close to you or an increased need to detach or vacillation between those two things high levels of irritability and frustration, high reactivity, losing our cool, having those moments where we think, I didn't even realize that that voice that I just used was even possible. 
coming out of this body, you know, people around us melting down, or people around us sort of really detaching. So really tending to how stress is manifesting. If someone in your life is sort of acting out in ways that are kind of unusual, go to stress first. If you notice that you've been experiencing some relational turbulence, don't necessarily cast off the relationship or blame the other person. Go to stress first and ask, you know, how is our stress level together impacting this relationship that we have created together? And then finally, you might be noticing the way in which your stress level is impacting your professional functioning. And I like to think about stress and work as the three E's. E number one, how is my stress level impacting the energy that I bring to my work? And I just, I just don't mean my physical energy. I mean my passion, my creativity, my love for what I do can get really diminished when I'm stressed. Engagement, sort of detaching from the work that I do and detaching from my colleagues. Go to stress first. It doesn't necessarily mean you should do something else. Check in with yourself. And of course, effectiveness. Am I still effective given what I'm living through right now, given what we're living through right now as individuals, as colleagues, as an organization? So I wanna take a pause here and see if any of that resonates with any of you. Anybody noticing? Well, not, not in terms of, so interestingly, not in terms of stress. It's certainly been affecting me because I am now one of two full-time remote workers at Cold Creative. I just moved to Pittsburgh and it's been like so, so much new, so fast for me that it's been just very uncharacteristically difficult for me to focus on anything that I'm doing. And that's where we're talking about naps and power naps and um, getting centered in particular for getting centered is a very good um, pinpoint phrase there because I had to be mindful to do a lot of that in order to, like I feel very obligated to, to my team and, um, and by extension to the other people in my life. Um, so I had to kind of do a lot of that. So while we were speaking about just there was, it's not actually dissimilar from, in a weird way, it's not dissimilar from closer to the beginning of quarantine throughout April, I was uh, deeply, deeply stressed and affected by the, the fallout from COVID. So it was a similar sort of thing. It was just, instead of dragging myself from a place of excitement, I was dragging myself out of a place of, Despair might be too strong of a word, but that's the one I'll use for um, want of a better term. So like all of what you're saying there is kind of making me re reflect on the different ways I brought myself back to. And now again, like the, that sort of linchpin phrase is the center. I hadn't actually thought of it as like a literal centering sort of, um, a centering sort of activity I was doing, but that's effectively what it has been. So that was, Definitely coming like top of mind as you were speaking through all of that. Okay, really important. I'm glad you told me this because you kind of are, have been experiencing a double whammy. If you look on the list of stressors and it, it changes, but they're like top five, right? Moving. <laughs> is on the list. I don't know which one it is, but it's in the top five. Moving, 
right? You're moving during a global pandemic. Yes. You're moving and you're working in a totally different way. It's not like you moved to Pittsburgh and you're showing up at an office. I mean, that in and of itself would be stressful. Sure. But you're, so there's a lot going on. And um, I'm divorcing during a global pandemic, right? <laughs> That's another one on the top five, right? Someone might be dealing with a significant illness or a death or a loss like that. You know, so a lot of us have multiple things going on that exacerbate the stress that is associated with one of the biggest unknowns that we as human beings have experienced in our lifetime. So your call to be centered, follow it, heed it, because your own being, your physical body, you know, sort of the heart of who you are is, it's like, hey, come back, come back, come back. Wow, I'm so glad you're here today because that very simple practice that we started with is inval can be invaluable. Yeah. Even okay. if it's just for a second, like I'm going to call myself back to myself because I know that in any situation, I always have my breath. I always have my body. I always have my feet, my spine, my shoulders. Always. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for helping, like giving me language to wrap that around, but you're absolutely right. Sending, uh, you've sent a lot of strength our way. I want to send strength your way for challenges oh, you are. Also thank experience. you. Thank you. Yes. It's, it's uh, teaching has been great because when I'm teaching, I don't think about any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And and you might notice that in your own work, because one of the, one of the benefits of what we're going through right now is many of us are actually engaged in our work at a different level. You might have noticed I'm actually more in flow because my work, which enhances or is an enhancement of all my inner gifts and skills is a place where I can feel a little bit of certainty. Like I know that I do this well. I know that I love this. I know that this is an expression and an extension of who I am. And so the work itself can feel like a sanctuary of sorts. There's always eventually a place I would get to where the work would become sort of that safe place. And, and then that would sort of branch out into the other places of my life. But it took, I would say like it generally would take like a good week of sort of mindfully working my way there and working through my doubt or whatever anxieties I was feeling. Just, and, and having gone through it a few times in the past, I was like, there's, I'll make it to the other side of this. It might, whatever it feels like now, I just need to, um, and I'll have to take those other, I really like that you're giving me more body parts because it would be generally like a, a breath thing or sometimes I would kind of find that center by going out for a run or something like some other physical activity and that would help me find what I would say like my breath. But the, the body mind connection was always an important element there. Yes, because when we stay in our head, we often disconnect from all of these other resources that are with us. Yes. And my mind doesn't get me out of my quandaries most of the time. Almost my never. <laughs> right? I want to show you something. I want to show you something really quickly um, that I think might be really helpful to everyone. And um, <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead here because I know I want to show you this model. <clears throat> this is called the SCARF model. It's, a, it's an acronym. Um, and it really is the neuroscience of what triggers us as human beings. This is a game changer. If you ever want to understand, why, why did I just get undone in that moment? Or why did I just go ballistic? Or why do I feel like I want to strangle this person? Or why do I feel like I'm losing my shit? Whatever it is. And if you want to understand why someone you're around is sort of behaving in these ways, 
is really, really reactive or explosive. So this model comes from the neuroscience of Dr. David Rock. And he was really studying what motivates people um, and or what gets in the way of our being motivated and really productive. But the model is really useful in helping us to understand, again, why we come undone. And the model really reflects five fundamental things that are absolutely critical for all human beings to feel okay about their lives. And when any one of these aspects of the SCARF model are threatened or perceived as being threatened, we can get really triggered. I can almost assure you that anytime you're feeling triggered, if you've paused and said, okay, which of the five letters of SCARF is feeling threatened right now? you will have an instant understanding of what actually is going on. So the S stands for safety. This makes perfect sense. One of the things that we do intuitively as human beings is we are always on high alert. Am I safe? And I don't just mean physical safety. Am I safe with this person? Am I safe with this team? Am I safe in this job? Will, am I going to have a job? Am I safe in this move? Am I safe in my finances? You know, you and I have a conflict and we didn't resolve it. Are we breaking up? Are I safe in this relationship? So the safety is about, can I count on this? Can I count on you? When that's threatened, we can become undone, upset, anxious. C, certainty. We thrive as human beings in certainty. Some of us more than others. Some of us are crazed about certainty. We need to know, have the schedule, what's coming next, what's happening in a week, right? We know that children, we know that pets thrive in certainty. When our certainty is shaken up, we can get very anxious, upset, triggered. Think about how certainty has been completely tossed away over the course of the last six months. We're not certain about very much at all. As human beings, we are born, we are born to be autonomous. We love a sense of independence. You learned how to crawl out of your mother's arms, your caregiver's arms, get down on the floor and crawl away and pull yourself up and start taking your first steps. And you learned how to sneak out of the house when you were an adolescent. And at 85 years of age, you will be hiding the car keys from your family members that don't want you to drive anymore because you want your independence. It is a basic human need that never goes away. We can't do exactly what we want right now. There are a lot of rules around what we can and cannot do and it's shaking some of us up. And just as much as we need autonomy, we need connection to the same degree. I need to simultaneously feel my independence and I need relationships. And you know how it feels when one of your relationships that's beloved to you has come under threat, or you're not quite sure where you stand, or it's ended, we can come undone. And then fairness, whenever we feel as human beings that we are not being treated with dignity, that we are not being treated fairly or respectfully, we can come undone. So I had something happen to me just yesterday and I felt like a crazy person. It was the situation, it was an email actually. I read the email, I immediately lost my capacity to be responsive went into reactivity mode, started typing back a response, and I caught myself because I thought, this is not going to go well if I press send. 
And I said, okay, what's being threatened here? I don't feel safe. I'm not being treated with dignity and respect. So my hair is on fire over this situation. And I'm very concerned about the injury that's done, been done in this relationship between myself and this person. It's hard enough when one of these things is threatened. When three are threatened, you can feel like your hair is on fire. When all five are threatened, look out, high risk to blow it. So when you think about all of these things in the midst of what we're, what's been happening over the course of the last six months, we don't feel safe. Certainty is hard to come by. Our autonomy has been compromised. Our relationships are different, right? We've had, we're either together all the time or we're living alone and we're, we're not having human contact. And many of us are like, why is this happening? You know, it's not fair. I didn't get to see my child get married or walk across the stage and receive his or her diploma for graduation. So when any of these things are threatened, we can feel the charge, right? So you can ask yourself the next time you start to feel that high level of reactivity, is something here being threatened? So that moment I had yesterday when I took that pause, what was being threatened, I didn't send the email and it moved me out of that highly stressed state. So it's a great tool to use to understand yourself. And it's a great tool to understand others. When someone is losing it in your presence, or they're uncharacteristically sharp with you, or they just don't seem to be themselves, you can walk yourself through those letters. See, if I've got my 16-year-old daughter screaming in, at my, screaming in my face and I'm wondering, what's wrong with my child? I might say, wow, she's 16 and has no autonomy. She hasn't seen her friends in six months. She just got her driver's license. She's not out driving. That might help me. And I, I use that example because it might help me to better understand her. So rather than coming back at her with the same kind of rage I'm receiving, I can come back with her with something like, hey, this has to be really hard, something like that, right? So that's an invaluable tool. If, if, um, if, if you've forgotten the acronym, go back into the, this recording later and write it down. Anyone resonate with that really quickly before I bring us to a close? Any comments about it? For the person, yeah, Holly. In general, without overcaring too much, um, I've been kind of leaning into, you know, I'm 18 months in, into therapy and, and doing things like that in my personal life. And I feel like over the last six weeks, I've like almost gone like in reverse, where I'm, I'm leaning back into old habits or old ways, or I have a little bit of problem with an explosive, <laughs> like reactionary type thing. And, uh, had an episode like that three weeks ago, and I'm just seeing a lot of that at the forefront. And it felt like I was more in control the first four to five months of this, and then again in the last six weeks, it's almost like it caught up to me. And every day I wake up with anxiety in my chest, you know. So I think like that acronym means everything to me personally, and I think it's going to help me with you know everyone around me as well. And I don't know. I wanted to say all that before because I'd love to just however your brain captures that, what maybe advice or or things that. Um, response to that. Like where it's almost like now. It's almost harder now, it feels. Okay. Like yeah. Now. So what, what you're saying is spot on, and here's why. When this happened, 
we did not have a choice but to just forge forward. We had to do whatever it was that we had to do to kind of survive. So we were like, let's go. Tunnel vision. I gotta, I've got to make this work. Or the alternative is I'm going to end up curled up in a ball in the corner, right? I've got to function. We can only do that for so long before it catches up to us. So for example, Studio B did a resiliency, resiliency and steadiness program right at the beginning of the pandemic. I almost feel like that content is more meaningful now because what you're describing is what other people are experiencing. It's because you had in your body and your brain brilliant. It knows. Look, she's got to move it on. She's got to move it forward. We've got to put this stuff to the side. But it's going to come back and it needs to be dealt with. You are not alone in feeling like you've regressed or, you know, that, that there's all this stuff that's coming up and you're wondering, you know, wow, I, I handled this better four months ago. It's because you had to take that and just either put it to the side so that you could function or the magnitude of whatever's coming up now was something that you would not have been able to deal with five months ago. So it's almost like trust that it's coming up at the right time and you're gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to manage it. And step one in managing it or meeting it is you have the awareness, which is everything. I want to give you just one final tool before we depart. This will take just a couple of minutes. And I think that um, it, it's, it's going to be useful for all of you. Doctors Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer um, created, well, they didn't create, but they studied the neuroscience of self-compassion. And they created something called the self-compassion break. And when I first learned this, I thought it was total bullshit. But it was also intriguing to me. Whenever something's presented and it feels like bullshit, but it's also intriguing, I do it for 30, 30 days. So this is how it works. I'm going to use you as an example, Holly. You've got all this stuff coming up. You're thinking, oh my God, I handled this better five months ago. What's going on? And maybe, I don't know if this is true or not, but you might be thinking, I'm disappointed. I'm upset with myself that this is happening. I, I really feel this and this is hard. So step one, whenever you're feeling out of sorts, triggered, uncomfortable is this sucks. This hurts. This makes me uncomfortable. In other words, I'm kind of suffering here. That's step one. The acknowledgement of I don't like this. Step two, I know that someone out there on this planet is feeling exactly the same way or has felt the same way. That's what we call connect yourself to common humanity. That does not mean that this sucks, I'm suffering, and so are other people. To diminish what I'm feeling, no. It means I'm not alone because sometimes when we're suffering, Part of what we do is we think there's nobody else that feels this way. I am alone in this. Uh-uh. Connect yourself to your common humans, common humanity. And step three, this was the step I really struggled with. Just be kind. So one, two, three. Wow. This really is disruptive to me. I'm feeling the charge of this. Step two, I know I'm not alone in this. Okay, then just be kind. You might be hearing this and think, that sounds like bullshit, just like I did. And I forced it upon myself every time I felt charged. I just walked myself through the three steps. It is a mindfulness strategy. I'm aware, I'm not alone. Be self-compassionate. 
And the first several days, it was still felt like bullshit. And then I just kept doing it every time I was triggered. And by the end of the 30 days, it's still a tool that I use. It's so helpful. Again, it is a fast track. It is a mindfulness tool. Fast tracks you from the charge of the trigger into a much calmer state. This was a fast hour. So you've got your centering practice. You've got some understanding of stress. You've got scarf to use for yourself and to understand other people around you and the self-compassion break. When you go into the portal, there's lots there. There's a grounding meditation in there that I did. So you can, I wanna just orient you towards that. Um, there's an eight minute singing bowl meditation that I think you might like. It's very different, it's very powerful. There's a nice body scan with Mariah. There's lots of things, but these are the three things I just, I just picked three things that I think you might like and that are very user friendly, okay? So thank you for being here. Again, I'm, I'll hang out a little bit if anyone has any questions. I know we went a little bit over time, but um, so good to be with all of you. And um, onward, onward you go. Thank you very much, Christine. We're very grateful for you. You're so welcome. Take good care, center, come back to center, okay? I wanted to thank everybody for, for coming uh, together today for this. And um, uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email early next week, directing you to the portal with those practices. So uh, please make them part of your daily routine. You will have access to that um, for up to 30 days. So thank you.